a little bit disorganized here, but never done one of these interviews before. But thanks for giving us your time, man. That's like totally cool. Yeah, no, it's 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 been good to to do these things, and it helps me get um, attention to the master's program I teach for. So I've got a lot mm -hmm. of students come my way because they saw a video I did. Oh, okay, awesome, awesome. All righty. Cool. Um, thanks for coming, uh, Ferdy. Do you want to get into the kind of introduction thing? First of all, do you wanna do you wanna introduce yourself, uh, Dr. Mullins, and kind of explain what you do, what you study, what you teach, what your work is in, that sort of thing? Yeah. So I have a PhD in theology from the University of St. Andrews and a doctoral habilitation uh, in dogmatics from the University of Helsinki. Uh, I do a lot of philosophical theology, a lot of philosophy of religion. So most of my work has been on uh, God and time. I've done some work on philosophy of emotion, problem of evil. Um, and so uh, different Christian doctrines like incarnation, Trinity, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then right now I've got several different uh, titles. So I'm a, a docent of dogmatics at Helsinki. Um, not really sure what that means, but sounds cool. And then I'm a lecturer and researcher uh, and in charge of the, um, coordinating the master's program at the University of Lucerne, which is a uh, philosophy and theology program in Jewish, Christian and Islamic uh, philosophy. And then I also am a visiting professor, a regular visiting professor at Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida, where I teach for their philosophy of religion program. You're muted at the moment. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I think Ferdy has a few questions just to, to get started before we get into the real meat of it. Uh, sure. You want to unmute and ask those questions? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm having like headphone issues. <laughs> Can you hear us, Freddie? I think you said he had technical issues. Yep. Okay. Oh, I'll yeah. start with the questions then. Um, That's fine. Yeah. So. One, I think the first one was we're curious, like what originally got you into philosophy? How did that start? Mm, yeah, so I was young and naive and I thought that um, philosophy was this discipline where they were asking a lot of the questions that I wanted answers to. And I also thought, this was the naive part, I also thought um, this is a field where you give these rational arguments and people have to respond rationally to them. Like that's just the way it works. Uh, and that, that that's wildly false. Um, like, like you can give rational arguments all day long and it doesn't mean anything. Um, but, but originally, yeah, it was, it was these big questions that I wanted to, that I wanted answers to. And I discovered that like this whole world of philosophy and theology, that's, that's what people are looking at. They're trying to figure out what is the nature of ultimate reality? Does God exist? If God exists, what is God like? Why are we here? What is their meaning? What is free will? Like a million different kinds of questions. So that was originally it. And then the naive thought that, oh, people will listen to me if I give rational arguments. All right, I'm back. <laughs> um, so I guess another question that we had was, um, if you have to put the history of philosophy in around, or history of philosophy of religion in about two to three minutes, how would you do it? In two to three minutes? Yeah. Um, I mean, my approach would be to say, first step is don't look at just the West. You have to look at the East because uh, Eastern religions are doing a lot of similar kinds of questions and projects in very interesting ways. So I would say you start with the ancients um, in, in the ancients in both East and the West. So you look at the pre-Socratics and then you're also looking at um, a lot of uh, a lot of ancient stuff in Indian philosophy. And then you just kind of work your way through to like Aristotle and, and Plato and whatnot and the Bhagavad Gita uh, and I think you should also, since it's philosophy of religion, you need to look at the religions themselves. You need to read like the Hebrew Bible. You need to read the New Testament. You need to read the Quran. Uh, and then a lot of the action in my, m most of my, a lot of my favorite stuff is a lot of the medieval uh, philosophers. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the modern era. Um, but then when I get to about the year, like late 1700s, 1800s, basically 1800, 1900, I think you can just skip all of that. Like, like most of those people, they're horrible writers. They're very convoluted thinkers. And I can just be like, yeah, I know Immanuel Kant said some things. That's nice. You know, um, I want to go back to doing philosophy now. Like, and 
so then I jump into the 1900s and then then on to today is kind of how I would go. Um, it's very cheeky. It's very tongue in cheek, but you know, such is life. Um, so do you have any specific like favorite philosophy paper or book? Oh gosh, it depends on the topic. Um, for me, one of the first things I really read thoroughly after I got addicted to philosophy was San Augustine's City of God, uh, which is insanely long. Uh, you can just get an abridged version and get most of the good stuff you want. But it's got so much random, uh, interesting debates going on there. Debates about the multiverse, you know. And this is in, this is like like four hundred and ten is when this thing's being written, you know. Uh, so we've got all these debates about the multiverse, about the nature of free will, um, biology, like what exactly is history? How do you do, go about doing like good historical work? Uh, nature of God, um, all these different schools of thought and how we debate them. So this is just it was one that really uh, was a game changer for me when I was first starting out. Um, and I guess the last introductory question, uh, I'm curious, this is my personal one. Uh, what's your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero? Yeah. Probably Wol Wolverine. Like, I don't know. I always go, just since I was a kid, I'm yes. just like, I'm like that guy. That's awesome. you know, I'm a badass. big Spidey guy. <laughs> well, I mean, these are all great people, but you know, I'm going to, but if you have my favorite, like that character, yeah. you know, it's good stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I think the next thing that we wanted to get into a little bit was something you probably talked so much at length about that you're tired of talking about it, but your uh, paper that you co-wrote with Joe Schmid on the Elotus mm -hmm. argument. So but we have a few questions about responses to it, but I think it would probably be helpful before getting into those to briefly just lay out the argument. Um, yeah, see if I can, because I Joe usually does all the interviews on this one. I don't talk about it as, as often. Um, so first step you do is you got to go, okay, it's a it's a critique of classical theism. So we need to say what that is. Uh, and so uh, um, uh, the model of God known as classical theism says that God's perfect. God's the ultimate foundation of reality. But every model of God says that, so it's nothing interesting. Um, when classical theism says, here's what it means to be perfect, and here's what it means to be the ultimate foundation of reality. That's where things kind of get interesting. So classical theism says God's timeless. So it's not God's just simply eternal, um, existing without beginning and without end, but instead God's timeless. So that means God exists without succession, uh, without any sort of uh, temporal location, without any sort of temporal relationships of any sort. To Then God's immutable, meaning God cannot change in any way, shape, or form. God cannot change intrinsically or extrinsically. Uh, a lot of people online get really annoyed when I say the, the extrinsic part, um, but you know, if you just read my work, I quote all these classical theists saying God cannot change extrinsically. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Just that's the textual evidence is right there. Um, impassibility, meaning that God cannot be moved or influenced by any external considerations uh, for his beliefs, his emotions or his actions. And then simplicity. And this is what the aloneness argument focuses on the most is the doctrine of simplicity which is the divine attribute, which says God does not have any attributes. God does not have any properties, no tropes, no imminent universals. God does not have any accidental properties. Um, so the property of being the creator, God does not have that property. You might be going, isn't that just uh, denying that God's the creator? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but they'll say, no, 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 it's not, it's not quite right. And there's some fancy footwork you do there. But the, the, the big idea is no properties at all, no potential at all. Anything you want to predicate of God is identical to God. Uh, so the, the no accidents, the no accidental properties, that's the thing we really focus on for this argument. One of the piece we need, uh, for the argument is, uh, I'm sorry, two pieces of it. Um, God is free to create or not create. This is a very classical claim. So God did not have to create the universe at all. We could have created uh, a different universe as well. So he's got options. And then this is the final piece, the doctrine of creation out of nothing, which says that the universe began to exist some finite time ago and 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 prior to that there is a state of affairs where god is all alone hence the aloneness argument and so we're really hammering in on that point of going okay so we've got god all alone and so now what we have to do now is imagine okay so we've got god all alone and god cannot have any accidental features god cannot have any contingent features and it's like okay so god knows that he exists all alone and he knows that he could create a universe well that's going to that sounds like that's contingent knowledge. And, and so you're like, okay, well, everything that's identical to God or everything intrinsic to God is identical to God. Knowledge is intrinsic to God. So knowledge is identical to God. If God's knowledge that he doesn't have to 
exist with the universe. He doesn't have to exist alone. If that's contingent, well, that contingent knowledge is going to be identical to his necessary existence. And how do you have something that's contingent be identical to something that's necessary? That's impossible. That's, just, that's, that's, that's one contradiction. Now you, you just kind of go a little bit further and you're like, well, okay, what about God plus a universe? Well, he knows that he didn't have to create this universe. He knows he could have created a different universe. Uh, and he knows that he could have existed alone. And you're like, ooh, okay. So you start, what we do is basically you start racking up all these different bits of contingent knowledge that God should have. And you try to figure out, well, how can I reconcile that with divine simplicity? I can't because it, nothing contingent can be identical to something that's necessary. And God can't have accidental properties if he's simple. And these things, contingent knowledge is an accidental feature. So what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to get out of this kind of problem? Like that's, that's, the, that's the big idea. All right. Um, I guess I can start off by asking the first question. Um, so Gavin Kerr, in, in uh, response to your paper with Job, he addresses a reason Aquinas might have against uh, premise five of the argument laid out on the paper. Um, he can says you that- with, uh, the, with the premises? Yeah, uh, it's going to be, dang it, I, I didn't pull it up. <laughs> That's all right, because yeah, I don't have this all memorized in my head, so. No, you're fine. <laughs> I think premise guys, five necessarily God contingently has some knowledge, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, yeah, so he says Aquinas has a reason to reject the conditional um, in premise five. It, it, it confuses the mode of knowing with the, uh, with the mode of known. Um, what, is, what is known is known according to the mode of the knower, Wilt, and so Wilt's contingent things is known. Uh, it doesn't mean that the state of knowing is contingent, and he continues to add that Aquinas thought that God's knowledge of things does not entail that those things exist. Uh, curious, what were your thoughts on that? I find this weird. Uh, one For one reason, I find it weird is because Aquinas affirms a very classical uh, doctrine of God's causal knowledge. So it's God's knowledge is what causes things to exist. So the reason he knows something is because he's causing it. So, and that's really explicit. And and Aquinas. So, so I'm already going like, so Aquinas wouldn't say these things that he explicitly says. Cool. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's like one of the problems. Um, and I talk about this, this kind of stuff at length in um, uh, my first book, the end of the timeless God. Um, but this is like well-known stuff though, too, that like the mechanism by which God knows things is he knows uh, and Aquinas is he knows his own will and his will is identical to his existence. So he knows what he's causing. That's how he knows it because it's not knowledge based on like perception or anything like that because then you'd have a causal influence uh from a temporal world on god and the classical tradition goes no you can't have that um so yeah i guess yeah i'm, I'm going i think i think i know aquinas would say these things um is, is one of the responses now the mode of knowing though this is just weird sort of stuff you see this in boethius as well um trying to solve the freedom for knowledge problem and and i've never been able to get clear on how this is supposed to work because the, the content of God's knowledge is still contingent. That's what really matters is the content there. Uh, so he has a different mode of knowing that mode. I just explained what, is, what it was a second ago. It's him causing. Well, how, is he, is he necessarily causing this stuff? Um, because then that's the problem. Like then you don't have God is free to create or not create if it's necessarily the case that he's causing it. Uh, so yeah, so I don't really see this as helping uh, solve the problem. Okay. Um, so I actually have a couple questions for you. They're a little, um, they're a little on the thicker side. That's right. Um, That's but right. just, uh, just bear with me. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is in reference to what, what paper there and, um, these questions are coming from, cause I think all the next probably 10 or so questions are coming from, um, a paper called the aloneness argument fails. And that was written by Look, Timothy, by Timothy Drew and, uh, uh, what is it, Grant? Yeah. Oh, it was oh by, by by Tim Paul and and, and yeah. Matthews Grant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember that. I've read that paper. It was ages ago. Uh, so yeah, so you're gonna have to remind me what the, what the what the claims are. Yeah. So well, some of the things that um, they talk about in this paper, um, one of them was like two readings of God's knowledge. Um, there's like a a reference, a feature, and a predication reading of God's knowledge. I don't know if you're you kind of remember about that. It's been a few um, years. So yeah, where, keep going. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so feature is like an item of po uh, positive ontological status. Mm -hmm. um, and so under a feature reference interpretation of knowledge, uh, something with positive ontological status other than God exists 
and God has that thing. Um, if this is true, uh, then it's impossible for God to exist alone because in every possible world, uh, there would be this positive ontological item that is apart from God that exists. Um, and okay, if so that is the case, you keep going. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, if you want to stop there, I can. If you want to give your um, thoughts, well, I, I guess continue. I was going to say this is already false uh, because if it's a feature, it's a feature of God, and it'd be intrinsic to God. Um, mm -hmm. And so, why should I? So, okay, so imagine um, you affirm the wildly popular view in Western thought that divine simplicity is false. Uh, it's called the attributionist mm -hmm. view because um, simplicity is not the dominant view uh, is in Christian thought, but Christianity is not the only thing in the world. Um, so the attributionist view says God literally has attributes and attributes are not parts. Why on earth should I think they're parts? This is the attributionist view. Uh, and and so you've got God with existing with his attributes, one of those attributes being knowledge. And it's just God. Like, what's this thing that he's related to? Like, I don't I don't understand the claim here. So I've already like I feel like I, the first half of what of of this claim from from Tim and uh, and, and Matthews is I'm I'm already going like well that's false I don't I don't know yeah yeah, yeah. no I, I I totally see where you're coming from there um so like the follow up was going to be like if that is the case then it'd be a direct contradiction with I think premise three of the argument which states that God can possibly exist alone right and then I was just going to ask what's your response to this objection but it seems like you give yeah. an adequate response. So. Yeah, it's, guess... it's something that was dealt with before Aquinas was born uh, in the Islamic tradition. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, awesome, awesome. If I can give some some pushback there to see what your response might be mm -hmm. to that. Um, so when they say they're reading premise five, which is necessarily God contingently has some knowledge with this feature reading of knowledge, where knowledge is something with positive ontological status, um, then what they might want to say is that under that reading, what premise five amounts to saying is that necessarily um, God's identical to something contingent. And so premise five already has something that the classical theist is rejecting. And so they're licensed to just throw out that premise on that feature reading based on that. Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, so I've got a slightly different approach to most philosophers with uh, when it comes to arguments. So a lot of philosophers go, you need to look at an argument for, you know, is it valid? Is it sound? Um, and uh, and if the argument fails, if I can find a way out of like to, a way to reject one of the premises, I want to go. Yeah, I can say whatever completely wild and asinine thing I want to reject any argument. But why would I do that? I want to say things that are plausible and that fit with other things I know to be true. So when I see a move like this, um, all I'm seeing is the classical theist like denying certain things that they're already committed to. So one of the things that classical theism is committed to is this idea that God, God's will is contingent. Like he doesn't have to will this or that. Uh, and so if I, and, and, and since his knowledge is causal, it's his will, um, that's going to have to have some contingent features too. And so if you read um, like Gloria Frost, she has she's written a lot of work on like medieval uh, views like Aquinas and Scotus and, and some others on their view of action and the, and the source of contingency. It's supposed to be grounded in the contingent will of God. So so if, if Tim and Matthew, uh, like if Tim and Matthews want to make this move, that's fine. But you're going to be losing like a whole lot of classical claims. And if the goal is to defend classical theism, you don't want to defend it by rejecting it. Like I, and which, which I know is something we say like a lot in the paper, yeah. um, but, but that's what I think is going on in that kind of move. So I think the move that they want to make in the paper is, you know, they're not defending classical theism by rejecting it. Rather, they have some other reading of, um, what was it, of extrinsicality, I think is, oh, the way, right. is what they wanted to argue. So um, they have this view where extrinsicality is whether or not it stands in a relation. I'm wondering if you have any oh, yeah, thoughts on that and if you think that's a plausible that's way That's the next question. <laughs> that was the next question. Yeah, could you tease it out a bit more? Because I remember reading it the first time and thinking this makes no sense. Um, but I've done other, I've been interacting with other people who've been doing similar kinds of moves and I don't remember which one is which. I don't remember which is theirs and which is like Josh Sijawati or, or whatnot. So uh, yeah. can someone remind me what, their, what the move is? Well, yeah, and so what I want to say is that something can. Oh, oh, go ahead, Rockstar. No, you're good. You're good, man. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, so something can stand in like a sort of extrinsic relation um, 
whether or not there's something extrinsic to it that it stands in relation to. So it can either stand in relation, um, a, a, like a relation can successfully obtain between it and something external to it, or relations can fail to obtain between it something ex um, external to it. So like not existing with something is just relations failing to obtain, and that's a sort of extrinsic relation. So no relation is a relation. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's, I mean, that just is the answer, right? I mean, is, is to go, okay, cool. Uh, no relation is a relation. So this goes back to my earlier point of, of like the way I do philosophy is like, I could say lots of wild, crazy things uh, to get out of an argument, but why would I do that? I thought the whole point was common sense rash. I, I lived in Scotland for too long. So the ghost of common sense philosophy has just been haunting me for a long time. And so when someone says there's a relation, but it's not a relation, then I just go, if this is common sense, then I should like to know what nonsense is. Um, yeah, maybe I'm being way too cheeky a, today. I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe instead of calling it a relation, because I think the, the context of the conversation is about extrinsic properties. So then when yeah. I say an extrinsic property is a property that doesn't, um, doesn't have a certain relation. Extrinsic property is a, so this is okay. I don't understand this at all. Um, so if I'm looking at just, for example, like the medieval view of relations, um, uh, so a relation is not a thing. Um, a, a relation just reduces to these properties that two different things have that point towards each other. So um, me and the chair, like the chair I'm sitting on, uh, we're in a relationship. Uh, and it's not like the relations a thing. It's it's just reduces down to the chair is a property of being sat upon. And I have the property of sitting upon. And so they point towards each other. This is what's called a real relation. Um, if 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 it's God all alone and there's nothing else, like I, I need that. Other, like a relation is it's a two way street. So I'm like, there's nothing there to have a property to point back towards. So I so I'm just finding this like really, I, I yeah, I just, I just find it very weird and very confused. I don't mm -hmm. know how to articulate what it could mean to say there's a relation going on here. Um, because I know I remember yeah. they give they get were they were they the ones that give the example of like sitting alone in your office, and that um, being like an example yeah. of like an extrinsic relation. You know, well, they sure. give like the zebra example. No. They give like a zebra example in relation to the zebra, like or um, they're not being a zebra right next to me, it's like that being a relation. Yeah, that's right. Relation. They give that example. That is, yeah, um, so, but I, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, like a, a, again, if if this is the theory of relations, is that relations are not things that they're just reduced down to these properties that two th actual things have that point towards each other, then this idea of I stand in the relation of not having a zebra next to me. That just sounds like an abusive language uh, instead of really getting at the the actual claim about what these relations are. Um, maybe um, yeah. maybe we can talk about extrinsic properties without making use of relations talk. So I think one view um, that's been given is where an extrinsic property is um, a property that implies that the thing does not coexist with some wholly distinct contingent object. So what's the thing that has that property? So um, I think what they want to say there is that um, God would have the property of, um, so the property of the thing does not consist, can, uh, coexist with some wholly distinct contingent object, which is the, uh, the creation. Mm -hmm. And is this a property that God has or does not yeah. have? He oh, has. Yeah. Because if he's got it, well, this is an accidental property. And so we've already, and this is the whole point was to say divine simplicity is false. If they're, if they're building in, God has this accidental property, then we've already got divine simplicity is false. So, so that's, so this is, so that would be a bad move. Um, and, okay. and, and, and if it's not a property that God has, then, then I've, then I've lost my grasp on the, what the claim is. That's, that's good. I think that exhausts my questions on the, um, right. the extrinsicality stuff. Okay. Cause I thought you guys were going to really like, you know, like berate me quite seriously here, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I guess like another issue posed, uh, by those authors, uh, is the potential ontological cost of adopting, um, I think the notion of extrinsic predication that you and Joe laid out in the paper, hmm. um, uh, they mentioned that a reason to adopt their whether or not thesis on ex extrinsic predication 
is because it doesn't commit you to saying there are things external to S in which S doesn't relationally stand. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, say the statement again. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so another issue posed by the authors uh, is the potential ontological cost of adopting this notion of extrinsic predication. Um, they mentioned that a reason to adopt the whether or not thesis on extrinsic predication is because it doesn't commit you to saying there are things external to S in which S, S is just like any any item, yeah. in which S doesn't relationally stand. Um, what are your thoughts on that in particular? Oh, gosh. I don't that know. was it, one of the objections like in the uh, in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, I think I don't think I'm quite understanding the claim at the moment. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a weird one. <laughs> so it, it's it's one of these things where it's it's so writ written so technically. I'm, I'm like, can you put it in English? No, it's uh, this, all is, good. this I, is another problem I have with a lot of philosophers. I'm like, you can put it in English, you know, but yeah. OK, so the claim is so say we so our view of uh, extrinsic extrinsic relations is. Um, that if God exists alone or God exists by with stuff, mm -hmm. then they God's would say gonna... that like you're committed to saying he's um, he's standing in, in relation to something, even if he's alone. And they think that for some reason that is going to like inflate your ontology mm -hmm. with respect to your notion of like intrinsic predication. They think that like it comes to like at an ontological cost, which oh, I yeah. wasn't really. I wasn't really understanding that, but maybe you could. I was hoping you could elucidate on that. I don't know if I could elucidate <laughs> at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. That's sorry, okay. bro. Uh, so <laughs> it, it sounds okay if if I said that, like, because I mm, I don't remember what all Joe and I because this was mainly Joe's uh, argument that he came up with. I just helped him clean up a lot of the stuff in the paper and then build in yeah, yeah, um, yeah. a lot of the stuff. So I'm trying to remember what we say about extrinsic relations. Uh, I don't remember what we say, so I'm gonna have to go back to what I said earlier because that's the way I understand yeah, it. Yeah, I actually I have a quote from the paper. If you mm -hmm. Oh, maybe, that would be helpful. Maybe that might help. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably should have done that ahead of time. Well, that's all right. I mean, um, sometimes I remember my things, but sometimes I don't remember what I wrote. Yeah. So I guess like a quote from your guys' paper. Um, so it, I'm sorry. I mean, Joe, Joe writes very technical. So he was, and I think I he was quoting like David Lewis or something, if I remember. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so extrinsic predications of S are true, at least in part, in virtue of something outside S in which s relationally stands oh um, yeah that's how yeah yeah, yeah that's fine because yeah you have to have something else in order to stand in a relation so that point i made earlier if you've got god all alone i don't know what he's standing in relation to um because mm -hmm. there's nothing because a relationship is supposed to be between two things and then they have properties mm -hmm. that point towards each other so th that fits with this account of extrinsicality which mm -hmm. makes me now go i don't understand the the claim from from Tim and, and and Matthews on this, if if I hold that view of extrinsicality, then how do I I would get this bloated ontology? I don't I don't because like I would have God all alone. I'd be like, there's no extrinsic relation. It couldn't be. You don't just don't have yeah. the conditions for an extrinsic relation. Uh, I see what you're saying. So I don't see how because yeah, so I don't know how I'm bloating the ontology. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I just find this weird. Um, yeah, I think it's I think I they're trying to they're trying to say that like God having some type of like. Um, contingent knowledge on something implies a type of relationship when when there isn't anything there in the alone world. And he thinks that because if because if you hold to this extrinsic predication of um, or your guys' notion of extrinsic predication, mm -hmm. then somehow there's like there's like this thing he doesn't stand in relation to, but like there is a thing there even though he's like alone. So I, I guess it's supposed to poke at like that sort of conception that you guys have on oh that's on weird that. okay so if i so say we stick with classical the classical view as much as i like i try to force joe and i to do in that paper um mm -hmm. so if, if you're a classical theist again you're going to say all of god's knowledge is knowledge of himself and i'm, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure we say that in the paper um so all god's knowledge is self-knowledge and mm -hmm. and him knowing a contingent feature uh contingent truths is grounded in his contingent contingent will he knows mm -hmm. i have not willed to create anything in the alone world mm -hmm. so this would all be internal intrinsic to god this wouldn't be a relationship to something extrinsic to god mm -hmm. uh given the the framework that we're trying to work with of this is the classical view and i think even on my own view the attributions view would be the same thing like god god's knowledge would be like in the alone world would just be self-knowledge because there's mm -hmm. there's nothing else to know uh and right, he knows right. and he knows he knows he's not creating anything because he knows himself it, yeah. would, it would be really, really weird. It's like he's like, 
did I create something? I don't know. Oh, let's go look and see, you know, like that, like that. <laughs> I, gotta, I, like, I don't get what's going on. Yeah. 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 yeah that is kind of weird. <laughs> okay. Do you think um, already at, at halfway end that we maybe should move to the Sejuati paper? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 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 Um, so we have a few questions from the, um, Sejuati paper. I think it's titled something like an aspect type response, something like that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I haven't read that one in a while. So yeah, you're gonna have to okay. help me out. Yeah. Yeah. You're, we're going to need your input on this one in particular. Okay. Um, <laughs> so just, I guess just to refresh what Sejuati takes an aspect to, um, or takes an aspect to be, it's. Uh, a qualitatively differing, incomplete, abstract, particular entity that's numerically identical. Let me throw all the all the technical stuff that he puts in the paper away. Yeah. <laughs> a, John, insofar as he's a philosopher, is something that's distinct from John unqualified. And what he wants to say is that John, insofar as he's a philosopher, uh, there's things that are true of John insofar as he's a philosopher that's not true of John unqualified. Uh, and yet John is numerically identical with John in so far as he's a philosopher. But that, that's mm -hmm. kind of a rough sketch of what he's thinking about in terms of an aspect. And he thinks that those are distinct from properties, mirological parts, um, conceptual distinctions. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Okay. Because I, I, I already want to reduce aspects down to a thing and their properties. Um, but, but yeah, so let's keep going with this, though, that an aspect something different from a property and doesn't reduce down to a property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So let's go with that as best as I can. Mm -hmm. Then um, one, so the first thing that Sejuati wants to do in order to kind of build this into a response to the aloneness argument is he wants to kind of redefine the classical conception of divine simplicity. And it's something he says is not the classical understanding, but is still a strong divine simplicity. It's not a weak divine simplicity. And there he just, um, let me see if, uh, if I have it written down. I don't think I have it written down, but essentially he just changes everywhere where it says um, there's a distinction between essential or accidental features. He, he just switches all those to say properties rather than features so that he doesn't have to be talking about aspects there. They're kind of exempt um, prop and there's just not a distinction between um, essential and accidental properties. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the first question I have is, do you think that, do you, do you have any issues with that move to kind of redefine the notion of doctrine of divine simplicity? Um, I, I mean, in one sense, this, this whole enterprise just, I, I mean, as a response to our paper, it just kind of makes me go, well, who cares? Um, because we're attacking the actual doctrine of divine simplicity. So if you want to talk about something else, that's fine. Um, so we're changing the conversation, which is fine because we could do that all, all day long. Uh, so it's changing the topic. Um, and you, so you still have God without properties, but he has aspects and the aspects don't count as parts. That's what I'm curious about, because yeah. when you look at the, the classical theists, they want to count everything and under the sun as a metaphysical part. I mean, like existence counts as a part. I don't know what that could possibly mean, but that's like a claim you get. Um, and so if, if I'm going with a classical view of like everything in your mother counts as a part, um, then I don't know why an aspect would not count as a part. And I don't remember if Josh dealt with that in the paper, but I think, I think it's because he's trying to just build something new. He's trying to be constructive. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, which is, that's fine, whatever. So we got this other thing and said, it's not simplicity. We can call it like, you know, uh, divine, like, uh, so whatever, I don't know, but it's got aspects and they're not parts. So that's the claim. Right. Right. Okay. Um, um, yeah. I don't know. So yeah. Okay. So keep going. Okay, so, um, well, one, Sejuati wants to individuate aspects from properties by saying that um, the aspects are ways of being of an individual and mm -hmm. uh, aspects themselves have properties and aspects are numerically identical to the kind of individual that they're an aspect of. So I guess one question is, um, do you think that, so do you think that that's kind of sufficient amount to say about it to get you to these things aren't just properties? Um, and when people use language like John insofar as he's a philosopher, that that's not something where they're just predicating some set of properties of John rather than saying that there's this thing numerically 
identical to John? Uh, I, I just find it unnecessarily complicated. Because uh, if I say John is a philosopher, I'm making a predication, obviously. And what's that thing? I'm predic uh, the property of being a philosopher. Um, if I want to go, well, there's these other things called aspects. I'm, I'm I, a, I'm struggling to understand what what these aspects are, uh, and that's a personal problem. That's not like a knock against the argument. That's just me going, I don't, I don't know. And now, and like when Peter Van Wagen says, like, I don't understand what you mean. Like, I, I'm just going, like, I just don't understand. Uh, so it's not a knock against the argument. But um, the second thing is, I don't know how to motivate this claim. Uh, and third the aspects themselves have properties right so he would he would say something like um john and so so john in so far as he's a philosopher does not want to go camping this weekend but john unqualified wants to go camping this weekend that's one example that he gives in the paper there's like some desire that's sort of property that john in so far as he's a philosopher has but john doesn't have he also gives examples of different aspects having uh, differential properties. So John, insofar as he's a father, um, wants to like take his kids to the fair. John, insofar as um, he's a hard worker and he's needed at his job, wants to not take his kids to the fair this weekend. Okay. Um, and each of these aspects of John has properties. So I guess if I'm fast forwarding to mm -hmm. the debate about divine simplicity, if the claim is God has aspects and those aspects have properties, we've got the claim that God has properties and divine simplicity says no properties. So, so we've like, so when I, so I guess it goes back to my earlier point of it, we've really, really changed the subject a lot. Ex uh, except for they want to say that since the aspects so the aspects have properties and the aspects are numerically identical to God unqualified, that that doesn't imply that God has properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't so they try that. to, ex they, yeah. <laughs> so they try to say that like God has, he tries to accept this notion that like God can have accidental properties, but only with respect to his aspects or something. And uh -huh. so in order to get around um, God having accidental properties, he just attributes those accidents to those aspects rather than uh, himself unqualified which I thought was a little confusing. I find it deeply confusing uh, because I, 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 I if, yeah, since I really don't understand what an aspect is and I, and I feel like if I'm talking about God unqualified, I feel like this is just a linguistic trick is what it feels like to me. Um, Cause I can talk about John, you know, unqualified. And then I can talk about John, you know, as a philosopher, but what I'm really referring to either way is a guy who has the property of being a philosopher. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if I don't know it, if I'm like that guy over there, does he want to go camping? And I don't know he's a philosopher. He still has the property of being a philosopher. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. And in, in reifying aspects in this way, sounds really weird. It sounds like I'm talking about uh, if I go, if I go really like really far with this and I don't know if this is an entailment of, jo of Josh's view, um, mm -hmm. but it seems, sounds like if I start reifying aspects, it sounds like I've got God over here and then I've got this other being that's God with aspects. It sounds like I've got mm -hmm. two completely different beings. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I've got two different gods that both exist, equally exist. And that's kind of wild. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, sh I'm sure that's not what Josh wants to go. I'm sure he's not wanting to go that way. If he wants to say they're numerically no. identical. So you like count one when you, when you go and start counting them. Yeah. yeah. I, I just find this deeply confusing. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you yeah. find this deeply confusing, then I don't know if this question would be good. Yeah. We can try. Um, I mean, yeah. we, we find it deeply confusing yeah. too. That's why we asked. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, did you have another question, Mike? I mean, I guess there's also this concern that um, if, you know, it, John, insofar as he's a philosopher, is numerically identical to John, John, insofar as he's a philosopher, uh, has P, um, then you get, you get some sense, like, seems like Leibniz's law or something would tell you that um, you know, John unqualified has P. And, and in uh, Sijuati does address this, but he addresses it by saying that Leibniz's law is only quantifies over properties that things have. It doesn't quantify over features that things have. So, I mean, you um, can speak on that if you want to. You don't have to. Um, I... I mean, I, I just, I, yeah, I don't quite understand this distinction between properties and features and properties and aspects. Um, it, it feels, I don't want to say it's a bloated ontology because there might be a way to motivate it. 
Um, but at the yeah. moment, at this moment, just shooting from the hip, I don't see how to motivate it. So it does feel like it's just kind of bloating the ontology. Um, but I know that Josh is doing a lot of, he's trying to ground a lot of his work in EJ Lowe's metaphysics and EJ Lowe is a very good metaphysician, uh, who backs up a lot of his stuff. So, so I don't want to just like dismiss everything Josh is doing. Be like, this is just deeply confused. You don't know what you're doing. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, I just want to go, I don't know. I don't know, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So a few questions. I was going to move on to, um, wait, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I guess before you move on, I just wanted to state that like, it just seems like when you say that like, um, in one aspect, they affirm some proposition in another aspect, they affirm the negation of that proposition. But then when you say the aspects are identical to the individual, then it seems like by transitivity, they're going to be with the, res the same respect. And that's a contradiction. And yeah. I don't know if you share that same intuition as me. Well, that's just how identity works, right? So I mean, yeah. it's just a straightforward entailment. So that's why that's yeah. why that's why that's why I just keep scratching my head going. I, I find this very confusing. OK, cool. It's cool to know you have the same uh, intuition. Okay, yeah. so. But it might be horribly wrong. I mean, so so yeah, we, we could have this great intuition, but we're both just like massively uh, mistaken. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, okay. The one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is time and God's relationship to time and God's relationship to creation, because I think these are things that you talk about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I wanted to start by seeing if you could like kind of briefly go over some of the popular views on God's relationship to creation and time. I know you've talked some about um, Augustine's view, Aquinas's view. Uh, one's wondering if you could explain a little bit those views. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've got this forthcoming book. Um, I'm, I'm waiting. Uh, it's going to be through Rutledge. It's going to be called uh, From Divine Time Maker to Divine Watchmaker, an Exploration and Divine Temporality. Uh, mm -hmm. And... And so what I do in this new book is trying to answer questions that I didn't in, the, in my first book uh, and a question that no one wants to answer, which is what is time? And, and which is absurd because I'm a member of the Society for Philosophy of Time and we don't typically debate what is time because we just go, hopefully no one will notice we didn't answer that question. Uh, and I'm like, no, that's <laughs> annoying. Stop it. We got to do this. So one uh, very popular view uh, is what's called a relational theory of time or a reductionist theory of time. Because what you do is you reduce time down to events and say it's just a relationship between events. Um, that's just what time is. And this is typically associated with something I call the creationist view, uh, which is um, how is God the source of, of uh, time? Well, he created it. Like time wasn't didn't always exist uh, and God created it. And so you see this in Augustine, you see this in Moses Maimonides and, and Al-Ghazali and a lot of a lot of a lot of people in, in the Western tradition. Um, the other view is what's called the absolute theory of time. Um, and so time is not reducible to some non-temporal thing. Uh, instead, it's, it's a, it is a thing itself um, is typically how it's articulated. But here's the weird plot twist. Um, when you look historically at the development of the absolute theory of time, it's it's typically the claim is time is a mode or an attribute of God. So you see this in Henry Moore, you see this in Isaac Newton and Samuel Clark and a lot of people during the scientific revolution. Um, when you look at the Hindu tradition, um, you see people around kind of around the same time period saying, saying the same thing. Um, like uh, Raghunatha Shiromani uh, has this claim that like time just is an attribute of God. So time's a, it's a, a thing in the sense that um, it's a nature. So this is what uh, Marcello uh, Oreste Fiocco says. He says time is a natured entity that does certain things. And those things are it makes change possible. Uh, it's the source of moments. And it's the thing that unifies a series of moments into a coherent timeline. So a timeline just is a set of moments. So I need to say what a moment is since a moment is not time. Um, a moment is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. So us just sitting here, like if we press pause in the universe and us just sitting here, that's the way things are, but they could be subsequently otherwise because, you know, we could press play again on the universe and then things carry on. So time is going to be the source of those things. And when you're looking at, say, someone like Henry Moore or Isaac Newton uh, or uh, Raghunath Raghunath Shiromani, the claim is t God is time. Because God is the thing that makes change possible. God is the source of moments, and God's the thing that unifies a series of moments into a timeline. 
whatever theory of providence you affirm, that's the story of how you're going to get, you know, some sort of coherent timeline. So those are the two views. Um, I There's not like a ton of discussion on these. So that's what makes my fourth human book so interesting. So if you go with this uh, absolute theory, you're denying that God creates time because instead I, I call it the identification view because you're identifying time with God. Uh, and so those are the two kind of views I see throughout just the broad history of, of philosophical theology in the East and the West. Okay, thanks for um, explaining those for us. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask about, I was glancing over one of your papers, um, I think it was titled The Divine Time Maker. Oh, okay, yeah, that was um, the foundation for this forthcoming book, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Uh, you have to let me know the name of the book then and, and when it's releasing, I'll definitely want to be getting it. Um, Excellent, yeah. So it, yeah, in that paper, you talk a little bit about uh, Craig's view, and I wanted to see if you could comment on one of the things you mentioned there. I, I found it quite interesting. So Craig has this view, right, where uh, God is atemporal sans creation, and then kind of upon the act of creation, he's like temporal, like enters into, enters into time. Um, mm -hmm whatever that means. And right. he's temporal then. And you, if I understood you right, you're highlighting this issue where um, at the first, like simultaneous with the first moment of creation was the entering into time. But the thing that was entering into time simultaneous with the first moment of creation is something atemporal, but it's standing in a simultaneous with relation, which is a temporal relation. So you kind of have a contradiction where it's the thing that doesn't stand in temporal relations is standing in a temporal relation. Um, is that kind of a fair characterization of the point that you were making there? Um, I can't remember what I made there because I, since I've been like, you know, finishing the book and I've just been updating the argument a lot more to, 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 to get it more clear, but that would be one of the moves I make in the, in the book um, is to go, let's look at what this means because the main complaint um, that everyone has against Craig on this point is we don't know what you're saying. Uh, and normally we can follow everything you're saying because he's a very clear writer. But this timeless phase, what is what is it, the relationship between the timeless phase of God's life and the temporal phase of God's life? Because it can't be a simultaneous relation because that's a that's a temporal relation. It can't be earlier or later because uh, that's a temporal relation. Uh, and so you could say it's a causal relation, but well, I don't know what that means because causes are prior to their effects like temporally prior to their effects. And that's, so you're going to get the temporal relation and you could go, well, maybe they're like simultaneous. Well, well then, well, then that's a temporal relation too. Uh, you could say it's logically prior, but logical priority um, isn't what's going on here because logical priority uh, is when two different uh, states are, they can be co-realized together. So uh, two plus two equals four. The two plus two, you could say is logically prior to the, to the summation of four but all that stuff is like, they can be co-realized. That equation can be co-realized. Whereas God without a universe and God with a universe, those are logically contradictory states of affairs. You can't have both of them obtaining. You can't have them co-realized. Uh, so the, the logical priority isn't, isn't going to capture whatever Craig wants. So then we're left with, well, now what? Because we've exhausted all the possibilities. So this is utterly mysterious. And Craig is not someone who typically likes having utterly mysterious uh, things in his, in his worldview. So it seems like a very serious problem. OK, um, that makes sense. One, one other thing on the time stuff, and then we'll try to see if we can get any of our last few kind of closing questions out of the way mm -hmm. before. Um, so in your book, um, The End of the Timeless God, you mentioned how um, somebody could be an A theorist and hold to eternalism, and somebody yeah. could be a B theorist and hold to presentism. And that's not something that I kind of commonly hear from uh, yeah. people who talk about philosophy or yeah. philosophers. And so I'm, I'm curious if you could explain that to us a little bit. Please, please. <laughs> yeah. So one of the biggest frustrations I had with writing that first book was trying to figure out what on earth the A theory, B theory, of time debate is about because you you've got this ongoing discussion from the from the early 1900s to um the like the present uh where all these wildly different claims are being made and at some point around the time when i was writing that book um there was a there was a conference that was being held just on the a theory b theory of, of time by all these big name like philosophers of time i think it was in spain and and, they, and everyone walked away from it going 
yeah, we there, we have no agreement on what these things mean. And I was like, oh, gosh, that's annoying. Uh, and that's an ongoing problem now that more philosophers of time are starting to recognize of going like, how exactly do you capture these, these two distinctions? So I would prefer to just get rid of all of it altogether because it's deeply confusing. But here's the idea. Um, so, so someone like Kian Dorr, he's an eternalist. And he says, I can give you an A theory and to have eternalism. And you're like, what? How? And I sat in the room when he did this and watched every single philosopher in the room going, but, you know, just lose. They're doing the same thing you're doing, going, how? How? And he's like, I just did it. I just explained it. Here's what he did. He's like, uh, the A theory says there's something special about the present. Uh, and so there's like tensed as an objective feature of reality. I got the eternalist block there. And I just say, uh, the whole thing is present. And he gives like some logical definition of what he means by present. And he's like, there you go. A theory. And I'm like, okay, I, I, that's, it's not what anyone wants, but I, I can't say why you're wrong. Uh, I really can't. So it's, it's all I can go is this is ugly and I hate it, but that's not an argument against it. Here's what you do <laughs> with the, the people who are B theorists and presentists. Um, this one's much more popular. Uh, so it's called an uh, airsats B theory. Because what you're doing is you're saying um, tensed prop, uh, propositions can somehow... They can't not. They cannot be reduced to tenseless propositions, but they could be grounded in um, tenseless propositions. It's a whole convoluted story about how you get that. Um, but what you have a bunch of presentists do, like uh, Tom Crisp and Craig Bourne, it, they'll they'll go, okay, fine. Um, facts about the present, uh, facts about the past, facts about the future are grounded in tenseless propositions. So I affirm the tenseless theory of time, the B theory. And I've got all these like tenseless propositions and that's what grounds all these truths about the past. And the only concrete thing that exists is the present, but I've got mm -hmm. this tenseless theory. This sort of mi mixing and matching is, has annoyed a lot of people. Uh, and I understand the annoyance and I understand the frustration, which is why I prefer to just forget about the A theory B theory debate, because you get this mm -hmm. weird mix match of views because of the ambiguity in, in a lot of the issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys at all, because um, it's it's weird. It's very weird. Yeah, I'll I'll come back, and listen to it again. Okay, yeah, we'll <laughs> yeah, because fair enough. Because this the philosophy time stuff is very hard. It's it, yeah, it's 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 one of the most hard, like most difficult areas of philosophy, in my opinion. Um. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll skip through the questions. The rest of the questions I had on time, Ferdy, if you wanna start asking the um, ending questions we have and see how many of those we can get through. Yeah, so I'll start off with the the one about Alex Proust and the privation theory of evil. Mm -hmm. um, so Alex Proust has a vlog where he talks about the privation theory, and I'm going to be going to add my own little way of talking about it. So, um, so knowledge is good, typically, right? Knowledge is good. And um, also knowledge arrived through luck. It's not good right mm -hmm. it's not the type of good knowledge that we're talking about so the jtb style get your cases right. um so god um god said so in the privation theory says that that which is consistent with god's nature is going to be good right so if i arrive at luck oh sorry I, I i look at a clock i form the belief that it's eight when it's actually eight when a broken clock um it seems that i arrived at this knowledge um at a process that is actually inconsistent with god's nature because luck is uh given classical theisms or some of the forms is like it's inconsistent yeah, with god's nature yeah um so i was just curious about what you thought about that because it's basically it sounds like the a lot of theists who hold to the privation theory of evil are gonna have to say things like lucky knowledge is evil yeah and you can't do that um i <laughs> I, I think what you're okay. So the privation view of evil, let me explain it a little bit more. Um, so the claim is anything with a positive ontological status is good, has some degree of goodness. Uh, evil is not like a thing with a ontological status. Uh, it's not, it's, you know, it just doesn't exist. Um, what we call evil, it's just a paraphrase uh, or a shorthand way of saying that thing over there does not have as much goodness as it should, or as I would like, or, you know, throw in your own ethical theory there. So everything that exists is good. Uh, it's just more or less good. There's no evil that exists. And, and so I, I, I already want to reject that because I want to say some things that exist just are evil. They just like actions exist. 
uh, and they just are evil. Some actions just are evil. They they're not just like a little bit less good or a little bit more. Good. Like no, they're just evil. So I already want to go. This is this is false. But um, what I think this uh, this this luck example does is just another case of that of going. I have knowledge uh, that exists. That's an ont that has positive ontological status. It's got luck attached to it. Gosh, that's not good. Uh, and it's not just like, oh, it's just a little bit less good. No, no, like like it sucks. Like it really sucks. So like it's just going to be inconsistent with I think this this whole like privation theory uh, because you've pointed out something with a positive ontological status that just is not good. Mm. Right. Um, so another one that I had is um. About the Deante. Can you tell us a little bit about the Deante? No, uh, I don't have that <laughs> argument memorized. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, no. So, in essence, I guess the question was about like, Deante wants to say that essence and existence are, uh, for God, they're identical, right? But everything else that has essence and existence distinct has like some type of cause for it, right? And I'm assuming you find this premise in, or impl implausible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, wondering how, how do you motivate that? What are like, like motivations to like finding that from is implausible? Uh, the short answer is read everything that Timothy O'Connor has written on uh, necessary existence um, because he, he gives you all the details there. Uh, basically, when you're looking at something that that necessarily exists the way O'Connor tries to develop it, um, it's just it, that that thing just grounds all of its properties. Uh, and you don't have to make these weird, confused statements about it's identical to its existence, because I don't know what that means. Um, but it exists. Mm -hmm. And and why should and, and by and by definition, it's not the sort of thing that could be caused because it necessarily exists and has all satiety. Uh so I think what I what I see in the Deante is just a refusal to acknowledge um the attributionist view. Uh which is weird because I know Aquinas is aware of it because he affirmed it. Uh, in, in, in his first commentary on, on Peter Lombard's sentences. And it was a very, very popular view amongst a, the majority of uh, Islamic uh, thinkers at the time. So basically, the, when I look at the Deante argument, I just kind of go, you're just ignoring what tons of people around you are saying. Can you motivate exactly what's wrong with the, with their view? Because they've already addressed, like Al-Ghazali already ad addressed the objection of like, if God has uh, like attributes, does that mean he has a cause for his existence? And the answer is like, why should I think that's true? just because you asserted this principle, like uh, motivate the principle. Um, so I think the motivation is the other way around of going, here's this wildly popular view, Aquinas, why are you, what exactly are you rejecting it other than just stamping your foot on the ground going, they have to have a cause. Awesome. And a uh, couple more. Um, it's about an um, predication by analogy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I want to know what do you think, what do you think it is? Uh, because when I think of an, uh, something you know, having been predicated by analogy, there seems to be something that's true of both, right? Um, that we're predicating uh, in both. So when I say something like when the classical theist says, um, God is good, like Alex is good. That to me is odd because wouldn't we say that if God, if we understand uh, goodness, it's just going to be that which is identical to God or it's going to be uh, given divine simplicity, right? It's mm -hmm. going to be... Um, it seems like we're predicating Alex is God as well. Um, and that seems very odd. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you drew out several different problems for the doctrine of analogy and for um, a different doctrine, which is like the sort of doctrine of participation. Um, so let's stick with analogy for the for the first part, and then we'll go to the back to the uh, Alex is God, because um, that's, that's an interesting case. So the doctrine of analogy, so you've got Aquinas affirming it, um, but Prior to that, it wasn't, well, the view just didn't exist. Um, so it's not like the classical view. So like Anselm, uh, Boethius, these kind of people, they didn't affirm it. And then Scotus, who comes along right after Aquinas, just goes, that's nuts. Uh, so here's Scotus's argument. And I think it works really well. Um, so if you try to go, well, what does it mean to be good? And then you give your definition of it. Uh, and then you go, the reason the analogical predication goes through is because there is this univocal core meaning of goodness that I can see that's true of God and true of a creature. Uh, but if I've got that, if I've identified the univocal core, well, then I don't need the analogy anymore. Um, I'm just talking univocally. So analogy either is going to break down into univocity or equivocation. And 
and here's how you can see the equivocation go because we just got the univocal core. Let's do the equivocation. If you say, if you say, well, when I say that God is good um, and I say Alex is good, what I really mean to say is Alex is good in the sense that he participates in goodness, and God is good in the sense that he's identical to goodness. Uh, well, well, hang on, that's not an analog. That's not what you said a minute ago. I'm a competent language user. I know how to speak English. Uh, you know, I've, I grew up speaking English. I know how, I, I, if I wanted to say those things when I said God is good and Alex is good, I would have said it. I didn't. That's not what I meant uh, at all. And you're just changing the subject entirely. So just completely equivocating. So that's that's like kind of how the a SCOTUS style argument kind of goes of going, you're either changing the subject, which you've wasted my time, or you I can identify the univocal core and then now I don't need the analogy. Now, the second part, um, if God is identical to, to goodness, this is, okay, this is what's really weird. So here's, so here's the background. Say you've got something like, uh, like the platonic forms and you have goodness, you have knowledge in the sense that you're participating or instantiating or somehow interesting and related to these, all these different numerically distinct forms. Now, if all those forms are identical, uh, which is what you get in a lot of classical theists, they want to go let's go with something called the doctrine of divine ideas, where the, the forms aren't things that exist by floating by themselves. They're just ideas in the mind of God. And then now we have to make God's mind identical to his essence and existence. And so now you've got all those forms are identical to each other and identical to God and identical to God's existence. So it's, so you're going to get a lot of absurdity really fast. If you're participating in goodness, you're participating in God. Uh, and you're also somehow participating in, all of God's other attributes too, because they're all identical to each other. Uh, so let's take a case of like, um, we have a new mayor in Philadelphia. Uh, I don't know if she's going to be good um, because she's just started. My guess is she's going to be terrible because it's Philadelphia. Now she's wise. She's wise. She, she knew how to get elected. So she's obviously smart, but she's not good. But if she's participating in wisdom, then she's automatically participating in goodness, justice, you know, you, on down the list of all the attributes God supposedly has. And I want to go, hang on, that, that, that can't possibly be right. Because that, that, that person, that, this wise and cunning, yeah, but just, no, no, no. Um, good, no. You know. So, so yeah, you're going to get this. And then also you're going to get the absurd claim of like, well, if goodness just is God, then I, I'm, I have the property of God. I have the, you know, like, like Alex is good. Well, Alex is God. <laughs> He's God in the sense of participating in God. You know, sure, that's fine. But still, that's absurd. That's like, absurd to say. So, so, yeah, I think this is like, it's a really... I think it's a very serious problem. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you. That really, that really helps. Um, so another thing that we had is, uh, do you think like the act potency analysis is compatible with like an eternalist view? Um, like an internalist ontology of time? Yes. Supposedly, um, I'll say yes. Uh, I don't like the, you're going to run into some problems, but the, the idea would be, um, so, so all the moments of time exist, and then uh, I, I am just one temporal uh, stage or person stage or temporal part of many, many different Ryans that exist at different moments. And I've got a whole lot of powers, uh, so I've got potentials to do things. I just never get the opportunity to actualize them because I exist at this moment in this moment alone doing whatever it is I'm doing. So it, I think you could easily give an analysis of how I have unactualized potential and I, I'm actualizing some other stuff. Would it be fully satisfying? I don't know. Um, I don't think so, but you, you, I, I, you can easily do it. And uh, another one, do you have a specific view on metaphysical modality? If so, can you lay it out? No, um, I really don't. Like, So one of the views I was attracted to for a while is um, is where you try to reduce modality down to powers or dispositions. So it's called like a like a dispositionalist approach to, to modality. But then when you start describing the modal profile of a being with its different powers or dispositions, it sounds like you've snuck in this irreducible modality in the back door in order to describe the phenomena, in which case then you've just got this brute, um, maybe not brute, but you've already you've got this primitive modality already there. Uh, and so I'm like, oh, maybe maybe modality just cannot be reduced down to non modal things in the way like David Lewis or whoever else wants to. But how to properly develop that? Man, I don't know. I don't know, man. Awesome. Um, so what are your thoughts on the uh, transcendental argument for the existence of God? <sighs> I never remember how this one goes because it was one that I always found confusing. Um, 
so it's just so yeah it's, it remind me how it goes it's like uh, i just know the claim so it's like god is like the necessary preconditions for like transcendental categories or something like that so you can't have knowledge without god you can't have logic without god things like that it's it's usually like any any argument of the form um god is the necessary precondition for x x exists therefore god exists and then they plug in different things for x so knowledge justification mm -hmm. laws of logic um yeah. mm -hmm. intelligibility um uh, yeah. and poss uh modality etc if if i put it in those terms and get rid of any sort of like presuppositionalist kind of sounding things um it sounds it sounds really <laughs> plausible to me like it, it like it because i think you could do a lot of work there um i just don't know if it's going to get me all the things i want but Mm -hmm. But I, but I mean, I do, I do think I need to have an ultimate explanation for where contingency comes from, and that's going to have to be grounded yeah. in a necessary being. Um, but I'm not really doing exactly a transcendental argument there, though. I'm, I'm just reverted back to the cosmological argument. But the mm -hmm. basic idea, though, the intuition of I need God to exist to explain a lot of stuff, I find very plausible. But the way I justify it, though, is not using the transcendental argument. It's going to be a cosmological <laughs> argument or a moral argument or you know, you name it. So there might just be me going, I don't understand how this argument works. So let me run arguments. I know that, that I know how to, uh, how to run. I don't know. Yeah. I could do, I think two more questions and then I got to go. Um, so the question I have is, um, I guess, how does your view compare to, uh, Oppie's naturalism? What are your, what are the, cause I know you're like an open theist, right? No, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm undecided on on um, if how, if the future's open or not. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, I guess like whatever version of theism that you hold to mm -hmm. right now, I guess like what are your theoretical virtues and vices of your kind of the uh, your theism? Right now? Yeah. So when I look at um, so Oppie's views, you've got first off, Oppie's got like these brute necessities uh, instead of just necessities, and I don't want any brutes in my ontology. Uh, so. I think if I have to go with brute necessities, I've already given up explanatory power. Uh, and that's and that's quite bad. Whereas something like Timothy O'Connor's approach to theism and ultimate explanation, he's already going to go, well, I've got explanatory power that Oppie doesn't have because I'm not putting any brute things in my in my ontology. Um, second, so Oppie says he's going to work with not, nece not necessarily like a principle sufficient reason, but something in the neighborhood, uh, depending on what you mean by the principle sufficient reason. But he's got some sort of explanatory principle that's going to look almost identical to something like that Swinburne's going to work with, something that um, Tim O'Connor is going to work with. Uh, and that's and it's designed to be able to say, I can perfectly parallel all these arguments and give you naturalism without theism. Mm -hmm. Now, what these principles do, though, that, that Oppie's working with is they're supposed to give me a necessary being. Uh, and what Oppie goes back to is what he calls a necessary state. Like there has to be a first state. And I'm like, I like that. That's what I, I agree. Um, but a state of affairs is reducible to the stuff that exists in the relationships and properties that th these things have. And, and so I'm like, okay, so what's the thing that's at the beginning? Is that a necessary being? Uh, and it's this singularity or you call it egg if you want to look at some buddhist views that are similar um it's this thing that's got all these indeterministic properties why it's brute okay uh and it just kind of goes crack or bang or whatever uh, and and then it ceases to exist and i'm like well well that's not a necessary being i'm sorry if these principles are supposed to get us to a necessary being not a necessary state of affairs but a necessary being that explains why that state of affairs is necessary you gave me something that doesn't have to exist uh, and in fact does cease to exist so you gave me a contingent being uh ooh, that's not that's not what you promised me i don't know if that makes sense but uh there's something i like realized just like about a month ago when i was reading through oppie i was like hang on mm -hmm. you promised me something else oh i see yeah so i've not um, been able to run this by oppie yet so i don't know if, what he'll think of it so I wonder if you think, uh, I guess this will be the last question. Do you think yeah. that the kind of um, whatever PSR Api accepts or that he wants to mirror, that the kind of notion of necessary, ne uh, necessity and contingency that they're using imply something that um, kind of doesn't begin to exist and doesn't cease to exist rather than just something that um, exists at some point in every possible state of affairs? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if you go that way, which I don't think the, I don't the principles that I've I've read from him, uh, I don't think they really do push that way. But say they, but say they do. You know, let's try to be charitable or say this is a way to fix the argument. Whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. You're going to now have something that needs to be explained because you've got this contingency in there that's supposed to be because the, what's doing the explanatory work is supposed to be something necessary. And I've got this thing that's contingent in there. And so I'm like, now I need something to explain that. So you've explained why it has to be there at the beginning, but why does it have to be? And that's what part of what these principles were supposed to explain. So I don't have the ultimate explanation um, coming from, I guess, a different angle now at this point. I don't know if I've explained that very well, because this is a very new work for me. That is why I haven't been able to popularize it. No, no worries. Um, don't want to eat up any more of your time here because we're already like 11 minutes over. Sure. Um, thanks for, uh, is there anything that you want to say? Uh, yeah, just if people are interested in doing philosophy of religion and not just um, in the abstract, but actually looking deeply at Jewish, Christian, and Islamic philosophy and then agnosticism and naturalism in like a really robust sort of way, the master's program uh, at the University of Lucerne that I teach for, it's an online program and it's it's incredibly cheap because um, the Swiss government actually subsidizes it. So it's way cheaper than uh, American uh, um, programs. And, and we've got like all this like rock star cast of, uh, of people teaching for it. And then I am one of the people teaching for it. And then I also do a lot of the personal tutoring and stuff. So if people are interested in studying these things in, a, in an in-depth way, just come talk to me because uh, I've got this really nice program that I'm a part of. All right. Also, everybody should go check out all of Mullen's books and papers, read all of them. Mm -hmm. um, Gonna 